I want us to begin this morning the same way that we have in the past few weeks online. I want us to read the Word of God together. It's going to be uh, John chapter 19 and verses 17 and 18. The title of the message today is not necessarily very creative, but uh, simply entitled Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. What I'd like for us to do in our homes this morning is stand together. Uh, take, the, take your copy of God's Word and turn to John chapter 19 and verse 17 and stand there with your family in the presence of Almighty God, signifying that you are placing yourself under the authority of His Word as we read and as we pray and uh, as we begin our time in the message today. The Bible says in John chapter 19 and verse 17, And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for our time together online this morning. Pray that you would speak to our hearts as we dive into this Easter message. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. On Friday, Jesus died. On Good Friday, the Son of God was literally put to death on the old rugged cross. Throughout the centuries, people have described what that crucifixion might have been like. And I want to share one of those with you from a Bible encyclopedia as we get started. And we think about the death of Jesus on Good Friday. The suffering of death by crucifixion was intense, especially in hot climates. Severe local inflammation coupled with significant bleeding of jagged wounds produced traumatic fever, which was aggravated by the exposure to the heat of the sun, the strained position of the body, and insufferable thirst. The wounds swelled around the rough nails and torn and lacerated tendons and nerves caused excruciating agony. The arteries of the head and stomach were surcharged with blood and a terrific throbbing headache ensued. The mind was then confused and filled with anxiety and dread. Tetanus would often set in and infect the body, and it would lead to convulsions that would continue to tear at the wounds and add to the burden of pain, till at last the bodily forces were exhausted and the victim sank to unconsciousness and finally death. On Friday, Jesus was crucified on the cross. And on Friday, we hear the sounds of the cross. We hear the, the chanting from the crowds, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! We hear the, the voices of the religious leaders, Are you the Son of God? Tell us! Are you the Son of God? We hear the false accusations. We hear the sounds of the cross, we hear the crack of the whip, and we hear the pounding of the nails, and we hear the mocking of Jesus. On Friday we hear the sounds of the cross, but we also hear the sounds from the cross, which is the voice of Jesus Himself. You may be aware but that while Jesus was hanging on the cross, He made seven statements. We have recorded in our Bibles the last words 
of Jesus before he died and was buried and rose again. And in those seven statements that he makes, the, the sounds from the cross, we learn about what he was doing for us, what he was going through and what he was doing on our behalf. And I just want to share them briefly with you. That's not the sermon, but, but let me share those words. Sounds from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He looks out at the crowd. He looks at the soldiers that were gambling over his clothes. He looks at the ones who had beaten him with the whip. He, he looks and, and understands the crowd and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. While he was hanging on the cross, he was hanging between two thieves. One of them was cursing him. The other was saying, why are you cursing this man? He's innocent. We are guilty. And he looks at Jesus and says, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Then Jesus looks down and sees his mother Mary standing beside John. He says, mother, behold your, or, or, behold your son. Behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And then he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You see, on Friday, we hear the dying words of a living Savior and here, here's what those words sounded like. Forgiveness and mercy and love and concern. Loneliness when he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The first time that he had experienced that separation caused by sin. There was the statement of need, that one of victory. It is finished, that of relief. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. On Friday we see... We hear the sounds of the cross. On Friday, we hear the sounds from the cross. On Friday, we see the mighty hand of God at work. What does that look like? What do we see? We see the miracles of God surrounding the death of His Son. And so that's where I want to spend a little bit of time this morning. In your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. And we're going to look at this account of the death of Jesus and the burial and the resurrection. And so on Friday, we not only hear the sounds, but we see the sights. We see the mighty work of God, the miracles that are done surrounding Jesus' death on the cross. And the first one you'll notice is in Matthew chapter 27 and in verse 45. And this is the miracle in the skies. The miracle in the skies. It says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. What we have here is what we might call the account of the miracle in the skies. Can you imagine for just a moment that in the middle of the day, it becomes dark as night. The Bible says from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, in Jewish uh, timekeeping, that was from 12 noon until 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And so in the middle of the day, right up to the point of Christ's death on the cross, Darkness covered the skies. It covered the city of Jerusalem. The sky was dark as night when Jesus 
uh, cried out that lonely cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The sky was dark while the men scrambled to offer him sour wine on the, in, a, in a sponge on the end of a stick. The heavens were black when Jesus bowed his head and finished the work of redemption. You know, an Old Testament prophet by the name of Amos foretold of this event. In Amos chapter 8, in verse 9, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. If you think with me for just a moment, you would probably agree that the majority of crimes today are committed under the cloak of night. Most of those bad things that are happening in our world, a lot of them happen in the dark of night. Most horror movies, which I, I, I don't watch, uh, but most horror movies have a, a scene in them, a scary night scene when it is dark. Night and darkness usually symbolize evil or something bad. Think about even some of the old westerns. The bad cowboys wear what? They wear a black cowboy hat. The good cowboys, they wore in the movies, that is, a white cowboy hat. In this case, darkness symbolizes judgment. Darkness symbolizes judgment of sin. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The penalty for sin, the judgment for sin is death. And at this very moment, on that Good Friday, Jesus is bearing in His body the punishment for the sins of the whole world. He is hanging in the place of... Of judgment. The Bible says, Cursed is he who hangs on the tree. Payment was being made. The judgment for sin is death, and he bore it all. And it showed up in the skies. It showed up in darkness when it should have been broad daylight. But not only do we see in Scripture the miracle in the skies, we see the miracle in the temple. There in verse 51, the very next verse. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Wow. The curtain in the temple that's being referred to here in Herod's temple was a curtain that separated the place known as the Holy of Holies from the rest of the people. No one else could could enter into the Holy of Holies. No one else could go in behind the curtain except for the high priest. And he could only go once a year. And he would go in so that he could make sacrifice Uh, an atonement sacrifice for the sins of the entire nation. And the Bible here says that when Jesus yielded up His Spirit, there in verse 50, in verse 51, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom. Scholars estimate that in Herod's temple, that curtain could have been as high as 60 feet tall. But it tore from the top all the way to the bottom, completely in half, which is significant for us. The miracle in the temple is very significant for us. It is an indication that Jesus, that God, at that time, moved from out of the temple that was made with man's hands and into the hearts of men and women, that He would no longer dwell in temples made with human hands. From that point on, He would dwell in individual believers. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's personal. 
But it also signifies that there would be no more sacrifices. That's where the sacrifice was made on behalf of the people. But on that day, Jesus became the once and for all sacrifice. As the old song says, He, he paid it all, and all to Him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed it white as snow. It is also a significant miracle on our behalf in the, in the sense that there's no need for a high priest anymore. The, the, pre, the, the priestly role that was played in that day is no longer necessary. Jesus is our high priest, the Bible says. He has become our innocent intercessor, and now, listen, we have direct access to the presence of holy God. The writer of Hebrews gives us some commentary on this, and uh, let me share that with you in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, that's the presence of God, by the blood of Jesus, that's the crucifixion of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is His flesh, His body was torn, and the veil in the temple was torn. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 says, Seeing then that we have a, high, a great high priest, that's Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. Here's the, here's the act that can now take place because the veil was torn in two. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The miracle in the temple. It has a little, little significance for us today as well. <laughs> we find ourselves under a stay-at-home directive. But the reality is the presence of God does not dwell in the round barn. And the presence of God does not dwell in any other building, church, sanctuary made by the hands of men and women. He dwells within us. That's why this morning, in your living room, you can be in the very presence of God. Listen to me, believer. You're in the very presence of the Holy One right there, right now, acknowledging Him with the rest of your church family and faith family and friends. You see, while the circumstances are different for us, Jesus is not. Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Guess what else is not different? Worship. Maybe the method, right? But worship itself, the Bible says we worship in spirit and in truth. The reality is this morning, you should feel just as close to God as you do when you come to a, a building that was made by the hands of men and women. But thirdly, there's the miracle in the tombs. The miracle in the tombs. Verse 52, we're just continuing on in our text. Let me back up just a little bit. In verse 51, And the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. The miracle in the tombs. Now, this is not a reference to the resurrection of the dead. It is a reference to the revival of the dead. Much like what happened in John chapter 11 when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. You may remember the story. Jesus, once He arrives there in Bethany, He says, Lazarus, come forth. The Bible says that He got up and He walked out of the grave. It even says that he'd been dead for four days and he'd begun to stink. Nevertheless, he was revived and he was brought back to life. Now, we don't know on this Friday 
when the earthquake struck and the rocks were split and the dead saints got up and began to walk around the city, we do not know how long that they lived afterwards. But we do know that they, in they inevitably died again. And that's the difference between the resurrection of the dead and the revival of the dead. You see, the resurrection of the dead, when, when we are resurrected... At the time that Jesus comes again, we are resurrected to immortality. Anybody that was raised to life in the Bible, they were, they were subject to the sinful world and they began to age and ache and experience sickness and eventually die again. And so there's a difference between the resurrection of the dead and being raised from the dead. However, this does remind us of the resurrection which is to come. It's kind of a foreshadowing of what is to come when Jesus returns. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I won't read the verse to you, but it's a passage that tells us there beginning in verse 14 that the dead in Christ will rise first. And those that are still alive will be caught up in the air. They'll be changed They'll be transformed. They'll receive their glorious bodies. They'll be caught up in the air together with those that have been raised from the dead first. And they will, the Bible says, be with the Lord forever. The miracle in the tombs does remind us of the resurrection which is to come. Now the last miracle is the, mo the most Wonderful miracle, the, the most astounding miracle of all. And in some ways, today, it may not be treated so. And the reason is, when we think about miracles, we are so materialistic and so carnal in our thinking that we get wrapped up in what seems to be the phenomenal, that which... Um, affects our senses, those things that seem to be eccentric. But the last miracle here happens in verse 54. It is the miracle that takes place in the heart. The miracle that takes place in the heart. Let me just read there from uh, verse 54. So when the centurion... And those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and things that had happened. They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. You see, this soldier, among other soldiers, was one who at first, on the outset was not a believer. He was there doing his job, but there was no reason for him to believe that Jesus was anything other than what the people were saying that he was. But his disbelief, his unbelief, quickly turned to fear, and that fear caused him to believe that he was somebody other than who the crowds were saying that he was. And it led to a proclamation. Did you see that? Unbelief, fear, belief, proclamation. These tough soldiers, these rugged soldiers, these strong soldiers were moved by the miraculous occurrence. And they were, at that time, gripped with fear. And I can only imagine that they were. See, at first, he was just the king of the Jews. You know, Pilate had placed the sign on the top of the cross in three different languages, uh, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, the king of the Jews. But after the darkness, after the miracle in the skies, after the earthquakes, after the, the miracle in the tombs, after the revival of the dead saints, the shout from a terrified soldier was this, truly, this man is the Son of God. What happened? Well, what happened was a miracle in his heart. 
He went from being an unbeliever to a believer. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, with who we are, right, not the organ, but, but with who we are, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, being made right with God. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So I want to ask you this morning, on this wonderful Easter morning, as we are talking about Good Friday, and we're moving towards Resurrection Sunday, which is today, is, is why we're celebrating today. I want to ask you this question. Have you experienced this miracle that God does in our hearts? Have you personally experienced the miracle that's being described here in, in one sentence, really, in the soldier that was standing guard on the day that Jesus was crucified? The way that we are able to experience this miracle is to come to an understanding that we are sinners in need of a Savior and confess that sin to Him, repent, turn from those sins, believing in Jesus as the Son of God who died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins, was buried in a borrowed tomb, three days later rose Again, the Bible says in the Gospel of John, as many as received Him, to them He gave the power to become children of God. You see, there's a lot of things being described in this message today. A lot of things that, that we're hearing, right? The sounds of the cross. The sounds from the cross. The words that Jesus echoed. The words from a, live, a dying man that was a living Savior. And, and there's a lot being described here about miracles. So what's the application? There's only one application to the gospel, and that's personal salvation. That's coming to know Him as your Lord and Savior. You see, you need to know this morning that this miracle in the heart is not this salvation, which is the miracle in the heart that God gives to us. It is not a matter of God making bad men good. It's not a matter of making good men better. It's a matter of making dead men live. The Bible says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. This miracle in the heart is not about reformation. It's not about cleaning up your ways. It's not about doing good deeds. It's about trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation. It's not reformation. It's transformation. We become new creatures. That's why it's called being born again. Born of the Spirit of God. That's why it's called new life. And we are referred to as new creatures who've experienced a, a tremendous metamorphosis in life. I want you to know this this morning. That no one that is listening today, no one that is watching this video live or even afterwards, no one listening has ever been so bad that God would not save them. And no one has ever been so good that they did not need to be saved. We all need Jesus. And, and you have to know that we can't get there on our own merit you know, the reality is when this crisis struck, our church began to talk about what can we do to help our community? What can we do to look after one another? What can we do to, to love people and care for people and meet needs? But we didn't do that because we hoped it would save us. We did that because we were saved. <laughs> we did that because it's what Jesus would do if He were here on the earth today. The Bible says it is by grace through faith that we are saved. The miracle in the heart is the greatest miracle of all time, past, present, and future. That is the greatest of all because it brings us into a personal relationship with Jesus and causes us to be able to, to walk in this life with newness of life. Remember that on Friday... 
we heard the sounds of the cross. On Friday, we, we heard the sounds from the cross, the words that came from the mouth of Jesus Himself. On Friday, we see the mighty hand of God at work. We see the miracles of God that surrounded the death of His Son. But on Sunday, <laughs> and I can't help but smile, on Sunday, Jesus rose from the grave. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1, let me read this. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothes uh, were white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. The gospel accounts give us a beautiful story of Jesus' followers coming to the garden tomb to, to, to see His body, to see the grave, to, to pay homage. And when they get there, they meet up with an angel who tells them that He is not here, that He is risen from the dead. Now, the Apostle Paul in his letters to the churches, writes a lot about the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, that was Adam, by man also came the resurrection of, of the dead, that's Jesus. For as in, all, in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own at His own coming. Did you get that? Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at His coming. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us new life. The, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. And so uh, because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have new life in Him. We're born again. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ also gives us power for living. The same power that, that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in us, and now we can overcome temptation and sin. And it is the same power that will ultimately give us our new bodies that will be fitted for heaven. Jesus was the first fruits, it says. The first fruits which means it's, it's like a farmer who goes out to see his crops and, and they're beginning to yield. And he takes some of the fruit and he tastes it, he looks and sees how good, he looks over the field and says, oh, there's many more to come. The Bible says Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. And we are the rest of the crops. Now here it is, here's what I want you to hear. We, as believers will be resurrected from the dead. And we will be with Him for all of eternity. When does that happen? That happens when Jesus Christ returns. You see, today we proclaim the greatest truth of all time. We proclaim that Jesus is alive. We echo the words of the angel. We say that, that He is not here. He is risen, just as He said and this means the world to us. No, not really. This means more than the world to us. This means heaven to us. You realize the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that which distinguishes Christianity from all other religions, all other world religions. 
You see, there are many world religions, and I'll close with this thought, many world religions based on philosophical ideas, propositions. There are four world religions that were based primarily on personalities and the teachings of those personalities. Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and of course, Christianity. Judaism, who would be traced back to Abraham. Abraham died in the, around the year 1900 B.C. At the, at the age of 175. Buddhism can be traced back to Buddha. He was about 80 years old in 483 B.C. when he died. Islam is traced back to Muhammad. He was 61 years old. June the 8th, 632 A.D., he died. Christianity is traced back to Jesus. 33 years old. He died on Good Friday on the cross on a hill called Golgotha in the year A.D. 33. Here's the interesting thing. Out of these four religions, world religions that are based on personalities and the teachings of these personalities, there's only one, only one who was resurrected from the dead. And you have to know that none of Abraham's followers, none of Buddha's followers, none of Muhammad's followers, and none of their writings ever try to say differently. They died never to be seen again. Jesus died and rose again. Only Jesus. And today we celebrate by saying He lives. But the only question that needs to be answered by all of us today is this. Not does He live, but does He live in our hearts? I hope and I pray that this is a good day for you, even though it's cold and snowy outside, and that you can take this message and that you can uh, benefit it from it today. You can, you can meditate on it and think about all the miracles that happened on Good Friday and then the greatest miracle of all in the heart and the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want us to close in a word of prayer. And I just say that if there's anybody listening that would like to talk further about that miracle in the heart, has a desire to know Jesus and be saved and follow Him, we here at Church of the Rockies would love to share with you the truth of God's Word and how that can be done, how you can personally know Him as your Savior. Would you pray with me? Father, thank You for this day. Thank You for our time together online. I thank You for our church that is watching and listening and for all the others who are watching and listening, Lord, who are not in Montana but in other places in the country. Lord, today we, we thank you. We praise you. We pause to think about all of the things that the Scripture teaches us about what you did through your Son, Jesus, on our behalf. Thank you for the sacrifice that was made. Thank you for the power of the resurrection and the love and the life that you place in our hearts. God, we pray that you would just continue to work mightily in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.